Should we introduce ourselves, you guys? Say anything about ourselves or like who you are, Daria? Or... I can say a couple of words if you want. Because I run Mimosa House, mm -hmm. uh, which is a non-profit institution here in London. Mm -hmm. And uh, I founded it in 2017 with the idea and a mission to support uh, female, uh, queer, non-binary artists, um, intergenerational. So basically we run a program of exhibitions, three, four exhibitions a year, historical artists. So kind of in, in an attempt to uh, re kind of, uh, how to say like reimagine sometimes, or even like to look back into like our lineage and like some forgotten figures and voices who we want to bring back into like feminist and queer discourse. Uh, but also emerging artists, uh, artists who've never had uh, visibility in the UK before. Uh, so that's yeah, that's my basically work. There are many, many questions. Well, not that many, but quite a few questions I've prepared. And actually, like relating to the conversation we had just before what we were talking about, kind of managing time and like relationships and negotiating all of this. I came across your quote, uh, which I found really interesting, also in terms of like, that helped me to understand your work better. So yeah. specifically in the reference to your sculptural assemblages, like multimedia sculptural assemblages, uh, where you combine like abstract and figurative imagery and different materials kind of, um, and kind of in this attempt to negotiate materials and kind of to tame them, you said these material lags and refusals correspond to the refusals of my preteen daughter, the pull of my lover, the needs of the young child we're fostering, and the strain of living in a world that holds inequities and erasures. So I find this quote, well, really fascinating uh, in terms of how I guess understanding this balancing act of the materials in this attempt like to stitch them together and assemble them in this fragile balance, but also how you are able to express in this act, you know, the untamed nature of the everyday reality itself and like inter like negotiation of interpersonal relationships and all the incon incoherences and disorders involved in this process and in the life itself. So I guess I was wondering how, like, would it be fair to say that the process of this assem uh, assembling and creation is kind of an attempt to structure? And also, mm -hmm. what do you feel while you work on these assemblages? Mm -hmm. And eventually, does it change your perception of certain things and of the reality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and um, um, I I think that like what you're saying in terms of um, like the work being so much about like being in relation to others is like so that's absolutely like in a way like I feel like the camera is a way to like make connection to document um it has this kind of like voice of authority that I've always been like absolutely fascinated by and like how to um somehow like get into that like use that for some other purpose um and and I think like I guess it so it is part of the process like partly it's the process of like being able to um you know pull like a piece of clothing or you know save a coat that a friend gave us or you know document and that whole kind of like act of you know placing these elements together and I think I think ultimately I was just talking to a student about this the other day I was like I think there's a desire for control you know what I mean like there's like like that that is like I want some type of control you know like um that's like definitely part of it, you know? Um, and, but at the same time, I also like want to like hold up and acknowledge like the beauty that lives within like the everyday, you know, like, and um, so that's also like part of it, like a sort of like a desire for control, a desire for connection um, and, and a desire to, to witness the the beauty that exists within our you know our 
everyday lives, you know, like, and like the sexiness or the, you know, the kitchen with a, a young girl, you know, a, a preteen in it. Like, it's like, so like, what, what are these moments of like beauty? I don't know, like um, a beauty of connection of like somehow like a moment to notice like outside of being swirled into this like larger system. Um, and, and so like, even though, and so those things all live at the same time as I acknowledge, like, I don't actually have control, you know, like, so it's like, mm -hmm. so even though there's this desire and this like being compelled, um, you know, is, is also like a simultaneous sort of like acknowledgement of like, but I don't, you know, like, mm -hmm. but then, but then by that same token, like here lives this piece of art that balances on a concrete wedge that's double-sided, that's like weirdly made of felt and other materials, um, like this thing exists, you know? Mm -hmm. So even though like I may not have control over all of the various elements that we just talked about, you know, um, somehow this thing gets to, gets to live as the, mm -hmm. as the document, um, the, the trace mm -hmm. of, of that attempt for control and connection. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think that that's like a really, like a, a beautiful question because I don't really, um, I, I kind of, to me, like speaks to like, why is it that, you know, like we feel compelled towards making art? Cause it's like, mm -hmm. if I can admit that I don't have control, you know, ultimately like, why do I still feel the need to make this, these things, you know, like, because I, I want to like honor that process of like seeking that moment of like beauty or connection, you know, even though I know mm -hmm. that it falls out and it's fluid and there's movement, but I guess I'm curious, Danny, if what your thoughts are in terms of making your work, like, do you think that, like, where do you stand in terms of, um, like if I'm saying that the work is like some kind of desire for like possibly control or noticing like a, a moment of beauty or wanting to like hold something, you know, how do you feel about where, what your work is doing? Well, I think what um, Daria was raising was how does form, how does one use form to, uh, how is it a mirror of, what's going on and there is no control. And I like to, hmm. with form, I mean, I, when I think about your work, you know, this idea of balancing on an edge, you know, where there's potential crash, boom, bang, you know, and it's happened. You work for weeks on something that, and then it falls over because it is trying to be simply balanced. And, and that word spill is always present formally and conceptually in daily life. It's, it's you know, holding something together that, you know, is bound to spill. And I think in, in my own work, I'm, um, I'm more uh, like seeking beauty isn't the agenda. It's more about recognizing the conflict and the emotional strain of what that is. And so, um, you know, in the use of, for instance, animal hides as a material, it's a reckoning with mortality always. So th there's an urgency to it. And then in terms of the collaborative work, you know, very simply, this piece at Camden, we're, we're shooting underwater, there's domestic mm -hmm. objects, the simple, you know, basket and cooking pot and watering can and you know, the, the, the playful part is like these fishing lures and those are all domestic and re in relation to forest best. So there's an, um, an opening up to a larger world besides our own. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in like what, what you mentioned about authority, because it inevitably makes me think about the edit the process of editing and the process of prioritizing some imagery over another. And here, well, I guess I think about the title of your show at Camden Art Center, which is Cuts in the Day. And I saw a lot of cuts in the, in the show. 
So starting with like the, the striking image of Danny's head uh, being cut with a knife, as if an attempt to like remove something st stuck inside or like for the blood bloodletting purposes, but also cuts they for, I felt to like the fragmentation and the way also your film installation is projected onto a fragmented screen. And in general, like looking at, at all your moving image work, the, the kind of quite a characteristic syncopated rhythm of the films, as if kind of rejecting the linearity and order, you know? And I also loved how Maggie Nelson used the word clump in relation to your imagery and your methodology. So I guess, um, well, I'm just curious about the choice of the editing process and um, in, again, in relation to order, I guess, what we've discussed before. Yeah, and what you said about rhythm is a big yeah. part and it's, a, it's, a, um, it's not a predictable rhythm. And we, you know, there's an, there is an authority in the editing process to shape meaning and shape different registers of emotional registers and um you know what we prioritize to show because we shoot often without a plan mm -hmm. so then that footage may be folded in there's meaning that can be developed through the edit and those are cuts those are literally <laughs> cutting i mean it's not film but it's mm -hmm. it's video cutting mm -hmm. yeah i mean i guess like i think in terms of order I feel like the cut, I mean, like Forrest Best, like part, partly that title is like in relation to like having seen like schematics and diagrams of like Forrest Best's drawings for various cuts, you know, like a triangle meant a shallow cut and a different kind of triangle meant a deeper cut. And, you know, like in, in his world, I think like maybe, you know, that was probably in relation to what he was considering um, in terms of um, changing his body or like transforming his body. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but in terms purpose, of- It was for a purpose of ecstatic experience and also transcendence from the binary of gender. Yeah. And I think that that's like, I think that there is like a great power in a cut because, um, because I think, think that like in terms of like our patriarchal you know capitalist you know white supremacist society like the, the the dominant society that we are within I mean I think back to even like how I grew up and went to school and learned history and learned what a story was and it was always something that was like coherent you know, like there was always this idea of well, like first this happened and then this happened and then this happened, you know, so there's something about like the cut that is a refusal of, um, you know, this kind of idea of like one authority of story, you know, and, 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 and specifically like a kind of like patriarchal um, idea of, of story or, or coherence, which I just don't even think exists. Um, so in terms of that idea of like um, order, you know, like I think it's like a an attempt to reorder. And, mm -hmm. and I think that also there's like maybe a question of like in terms of how we understand, um, which is like maybe we, maybe we can understand in ways other than, um, you know, that sort of quintessential like you know rising action you know denouement maybe there's ways of understanding through our body like or through sound or like through like a kind of like a more like felt haptic you know way of understanding a story we just don't even really know you know um because we don't spend much time thinking about it so so those cuts maybe are like an invitation in some ways to like consider the world through like a different kind of you know, formal um, paradigm, like whether it's, you know, color or shape or, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, I think, and I think the other thing is that like with a cut, like often comes blood, you know, like, so mm -hmm. there's like a kind of like a, a messiness to 
a cut possibly as well. Or like when I cut fabric, there's often like an edge that's like, you know, um, that can show a fray or like where, where that occurred. So there's like an acknowledgement of, um, you know, that, that things have been pulled apart and then put back together. When I saw the, the, the image of the cut on the head, I, I, I kept thinking about like, well, some religious imagery, of course, you know, when like, or kind of when, almost like inviting to touch the wound, mm. you know, um, or also like, also like the blood made me, made me think about being this like universal kind of conductor and, and the transmitter you know, and how you mix it with water and how you, you know, how you bury stone, like mixed with blood and, uh, you know, all of that. Um, and I guess like a lot of bloodletting that recurs in different, you know, works, but all of that inevitably make me kind of reflect on kind of ritualistic aspect of this, you know, of these images and kind of, because bloodletting is, is in a way is also a sacrifice, you know, and um, so I, I'm curious about your relation to like the ritual and to the to spirituality, because oh. it sounds like it's a recurrent motif. I'm not sure like intentional or not. Um, well, um, I think that you sort of pinpointed some of the approach to narrative um, because things are symbolic uh, and, and, and we follow somewhat of a story to, uh, to guide the next moves um, or we can find out what needs to be shot when, when we're working. And um, that cut in the head, I tried to do it as an animation, but um, the idea was, you know, the ritual of these lesbian witches in Ohio is to, it's magic on behalf of creating children that don't need water to survive climate crisis. So in order to perform the ritual, one has to be free of fear. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly a, a spiritual practice, um, an effort because of being riddled with fear because of capitalism. You know, it just incites fear and urgency and panic to live within this capitalist system. So um, there is an effort towards magic and an effort towards undoing, you know, learned behavior. And I think that that is a spiritual quest. Mm -hmm. And somehow subverting, because for me, inevitably, you know, when we exist within this, well, I guess reality is where there is still like the, you know, the religious imagery in the museums, in kind of, you know, public spaces <laughs> uh, is quite overwhelming and still present. And like, if we talk about education, you know, I think it's still quite present you know the, the figure of you know some religious figures and uh, so I think in a way you know how you subvert and almost like rethink the um, you know recontextualize this imagery which has roots in some religious yeah narratives or can be viewed in that light yeah it's, I mean I, I feel like the um I mean, it's interesting to like consider like I, I I feel like like we've we have like in the past like talked about like blood like in various ways in terms of like as something that is not necessarily in our culture like um like that we're not really allowed to speak about as women like in terms of like we've talked about blood um and it's, you know, like the fact that like when you start bleeding or having your period, like, you know, like I remember just being like mortified of like, you know, the times that you would like bleed through and blood was visible. And like the whole point was that you don't talk about it. It's not visible. Mm -hmm. um, and and then like we've talked, you know, talked about blood and childbirth and, um, and, and and then like 
you know, as we were saying at the very beginning, like getting older and like, you know, like menopause, like also like totally untalked about and, um, and sort of like the ending of like a certain kind of, um, you know, perceived value or capacity in our, you know, um, you know, patriarchal society. Right. So, so I don't know, like we've talked about blood in relationship to like, just like the, even the ability to, use it as a as a material it just feels um empowering you know um and and so i think like that religious or like spiritual part of it is like um there's like something ecstatic about like using a material that you're not really like supposed to you know like so there's like something about that like and i think that um I, I don't know, like, I remember, like, my mom, like, being like, Sheila, like, why do you have to use so much blood, you know, like, and, um, and I just remember being like, but why not, you know what I mean? Like, why not? Like, why wouldn't Danny and I, like, you know, chase each other? And I mean, speaking of, like, you know, religious or like, you know, like spiritual, like, you know, the fight scene in our culture is like, like quintessential, you know what I mean? Like, it's just quintessential. So just to be able to, like, re-inhabit that as ourselves and feel like this material that maybe is associated with like you know either like spirituality or the body of Christ or some other like you know or with like a fight scene like but to like use this material or like pull it into like a capacity for like daily use you know like it's like we have a huge freaking gallon of blood and we've made our own blood and all you need is molasses and red dye you know, and, and like, it can do amazing things. You can drop it into water. It's gorgeous. It just does these things. It's like a formal wonder, you know? Um, and so I guess like there is like a spirituality that like, I feel like is also a spirituality of like, this too can be yours, you know, like this too, this material too is available, you know, like, and, um, and it's common. So. Everybody has it. You know, it's not a it's not a particular to us. It's it's everybody's interior world. And I, I'm really interested in that in terms of, you know, racism and ableism and class. It's like we have something shared mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. inside. Mm -hmm. Literally. Yeah, universal, yeah, universal uh yeah, cells that we all share. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess like, too, like, it's also interesting to think about like, you know, um, you know, uh, what does, you know, what does spirituality yield, you know, like, um, because like in the case of Forrest Best, like he was certainly tied to like, you know, spirituality in various ways and certainly like heavily influenced by like Christianity and talked about, I mean, that was like part of how that video piece came to be was that like he talked about like the first time that he cut himself was like this release of blood and in his like urine but he likened it to this moment in the bible of like a, an ecstatic moment of like blood and water you know and this this mm -hmm. release um and but like you know there's like the spiritual like Danny and I are always like um we disagree about lots of things but um but even in the video piece blood and water like Danny sees like the the blood as birthing basically those pots and pans that you see on the bottom of the ocean floor you know like so it's like for it that's not what I see but like but I just find that so interesting like that this like beautiful kind of like you know experience that that feels to me like on a it's like a formal spiritual level you mm -hmm. know um in terms of the like obscuring of the screen with the red like that it would yield a bunch of freaking pots and pans you know mm -hmm. what i mean like that that would be like the culmination of your spiritual quest is like a pot you know mm -hmm. like it's just like like i just like find that like a really interesting like rerouting of like what the point of you know, um, what the end game of like spirituality is, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but yeah, but I see it as like birthing women warriors. So that's, that's different altogether. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking about your work, which consists of over a hundred Polaroid images. 
uh, in which you take photographs, Polaroid photographs, and then you cover them with gold leaf, and then you scratch on the surface, quite abstract image, imagery. And then again, like there is a reference to cuts or like scratches that reveal and give us kind of a glimpse of, you know, figurative imagery that we can guess is behind the gold, the golden surface. So again, interesting, you know, I guess reference to like icons potentially, but there is something spiritual in the gold, in the color of, of gold, isn't there? But also mainly I think, I was thinking about like lay, like opacity or like revealing and uh, versus uh, hiding and kind of, it makes me think about representation and the choice you make in this specific work, but, but also maybe in some others when you use abstract imagery or materials, like the choice of non-spectacularity, you know, and how actually not showing can be a, a powerful gesture of resistance in some situations. So I guess, but on the other hand, you do include very, like, very intimate images in your works. You know, so I guess I'm interested in this friction and this balance and this negotiation of what to hide, what to reveal, and what's the reasoning behind these decisions. Oh. Yeah, that's like, I, I love that. Um, that's such a, also, I feel like I'm like, that's such a good um, query, you know, because sometimes I feel like some of these things are more intuitive in terms of like the video work and um and I think that there's like something really again like maybe a, a proposal for um <clears throat> just how to look or experience the world that's like both like embodied you know like using our own bodies as like often those vehicles as embodied and also like a formal query you know like so like how how do those things kind of get held together as a way of like making sense? Like how can it go from a scene of like, you know, I'm trying to remember in like SOTD, like I think that at one point like we're, there's like a scene where we're having sex and I have my period, you know, and, um, but then it like goes to, what does it go to from there, Danny? Like the, um, oh, maybe it, like, maybe it goes straight from there to the, um, when you're after the fears being cut out, but I, I'm just thinking of like, there's like, or maybe, maybe I'm thinking then too of like the scene where like that kind of weird um, material is being rolled on the floor, oh, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. like that, um, like the bull kelp yeah, and the bull kelp. on the, on the red floor. And just this idea of like that one thing that's like so embodied could somehow be equivalent with like this, like a red glowing gym floor with like a C, form on top of it you know what I mean like that these things can somehow be held together um you know feels like a way of like you're like both being like very vulnerable but at the same time like saying like but you may not know how these things mean you know what I mean so there's like a way of like hiding as well like through form formal choices and um and how you like cut or put the story together and I don't know if Danny will agree with me on that but in terms of like the other part of that question, which I feel like in a way re re refers to is, is much more to do with us being um, a family, like parents, you know, which is, um, which is like, how do you hold your children within the work? Um, and this is like basically an eternal question um, for, for us, like, because you can see at the beginning in SOTD, Rose is much more present in the work. And when it comes to FFI, she's less present you know, and, um, you know, she's now 12 and there's like a different, she has different interests and, um, uh, so, and, and yeah, Willingness. and, and willingnesses, you know, so, um, so and respecting that, her. And yeah. I think Sheila, a lot of times, you know, choices are made based on desire. Um, what do we want to see? And, you know, the idea of the lesbian desire on the silver screen isn't very present in, in the media. And we have a desire to see it and we have at hand our own bodies to use a lot more 
easy, easily than finding other people. Um, you know, but we found Chantel Ackerman's sex scene, which is phenomenal. Um, and the reason those Polaroids are concealing, are concealed is because of legalities as a foster family. We're not allowed to show this little girl, uh, but the same desire is there to document. So we went forward with the document and then followed the rules of concealing her face and um but honoring her and you know she she has a place in the in the family just like rose does but she is getting older and refusing so that's and, just and and also want still wanting to be part of it it's a very interesting this is a very interesting age of like the push pull push pull because rose actually came to see the show and like her favorite thing in the show was the piece like where she's looking out the kitchen window because like it's like you know it's the same as any of us like we like to see proof that we exist you know what i mean and like rose seeing that image i think is like proof that she exists and is is like integral not just to like our family but even like the part of us that is um you know our, our artists and and i think that like with sky like it is like certainly like i agree danny like it is like legality um i mean i think part of making work that holds children our children within it is like feeling somewhat conflicted you know what i mean like i just like not knowing what the right answer is you know because um like we are like in these systems of power i mean the foster care system is itself like inherently flawed um and paternalistic and you know um <laughs> affects like you know mostly poor people in our you know like it just feels like a perpetuation of certain things um so I feel you know there's like a part of me that feels conflicted you know um about just like what is my power in relation to this but then there is like exactly what Danny was saying like it's like also like a need to make document to make a gesture to the thing that we are experiencing you know um and so it's better to me, it feels like better to try to do that than than be afraid, um, and and better to try to represent what is in our life, you know, as a queer family, um, than to not, you know. Um, so, uh, so in the case of those Polaroids, like, I think it's really interesting to think about them, like, as the gold, as like some kind of like religious, you know, motif or burnishing, um, and, but they are like a way of like like allowing, I mean, the title of that piece feels like so crucial to who, what that piece is, which is like, may you choose your own form of representation, you know? So it's like, may you, you know, Sky, may you choose how you want to be represented, you know what I mean? Like, and, and may this be like a gesture towards like that kind of like, you know, there's a sense of possibility here with these marks that Danny has made into the photographs I've taken and gold leafed and, um, you know, and, and it does like, I mean, it's hard to think about the word opacity and not think about like glissant and like his idea of opacity being like a strategy for like, why do I have to show everything to you? You know what I mean? Like, why does my otherness need to be like, you know, visible for, and for, you know what I mean? So, and for like, similarly thinking about like sky, it's like, may you choose what you want to make visible, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, you know, and, um, but so, at this point, Sheila, she has no control of it. She's two I know. years old. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I think it's tied to, you know, documenting our family because of the recognition that it's going to change and there's a desire to capture. I mean, that to me is the whole reason to shoot video at all, is because this is this is a moment that will never be again. And I can't seem to let go <laughs> without a record. It's sentimental. I don't know if it's only sentimental, though. I don't know if it's only sentimental. Like, I, I agree, Danny. Like, it's like there's like, like there's these amazing, but it's also like, I think it comes back, or at least like it's like sentimental, but it's like desire to like make something, like, or hold something up, like that, that speaks or holds that time. It's like desire to document as well. 
what you said about uh being under no obligation to show or reveal or like represent otherness i thought it's a very interesting point um and um my question was actually quoting monique, monique wittig who you also quote and obviously in, in your work um so i the quote is from the straight mind and it goes like this. So, a text by a minority writer is effective only if it succeeds in making the minority point of view universal. In claiming the lesbian point of view as universal, she overturns the concepts to which we are accustomed. For up to this point, minority writers had to add the universal to their points of view if they wished to attain the unquestioned universality of the dominant class. And I guess, what is your position on this statement and how this concept of universal view and dominant choice is reflected in your work? Sheila, I want to jump in with pride, pride parades. I, I, we can't even go to them anymore because they've become these corporate floats, you know, to say we are supportive of LGBTQAI, uh, like, because they'll get more business. I mean, all the queer, the freak show is, you know, no longer really part of it. And I find it sad, you know, to just, melt in to the status quo. There's power in being queer. Yeah. And it isn't conformal, conforming. Yeah. I mean I I <clears throat> I agree. I mean we always like we went to like one of the kind of like, you know, mainstream pride parades last year and I was trying to find like positives in the sense that like hey, maybe if you work at Huntington Bank and you're queer, like it feels good that your bank has a float. You know what I mean? But it sort of seems like it kind of gets like, sort of like swirled up into this like um, sanitization of queerness and like all queers just want to be hetero, you know, heteronormative queers, you know, and have families and, um, you know, like just be like, let's just be normal, you know, like, and like, it's like, hell no. You know what I mean? Like even our family is like, is not normal. You know what I mean? Like we have no desire to be like the, um, uh, I hope we have no desire to like fall into that kind of like heteronormative um, trap, you know? And it's like, may we always put bags of water up in the kitchen and have to negotiate them. You know what I mean? And may we always make work that somehow involves our children in ways that I feel like deeply, you know, conflicted about just as conflicted and ambivalent as I feel about being a parent at times, you know, like, so may all of those things exist without this kind of like, you know, sanitized version of, uh, queerness upon us. And, you know, I think that like when I was listening to the quote that you were sharing, Daria, like I felt like on the one hand, you know, like it's like uh, it kind of, you know, like it kind of goes like, you know, if we were really trying to kind of like make ourselves accessible to the mainstream, we'd be making like mainstream narratives. You know what I mean? We'd be speaking in the universal voice of like, you know, a a, a in, you know a um predictable you know narrative but we're not you know what i mean we're absolutely not whether it's in the like you know danny's paintings and drawings or like the photo you know double sided it's like we may be inhabiting these medias but we are not like making the things that you like that are readily understandable you know, um, and maybe that's to our detriment, you know, like maybe people just find it like too weird and strange. Um, but, but I, so I, so I'm absolutely like in favor of like, let's not have to adopt the universal voice. You know what I mean? But at that exact same time, let's pretend to have a universal voice. You know what I mean? So like in the same way that like, 
those, um, uh, you know, there's that moment when it's like the lesbian witches in Ohio are like doing their thing, you know, like that somehow like we could imagine a world in which like the lesbian witches would be like on the news. It's like, they'll never be on the news, you know? Um, uh, I mean, and this is tied to this, this title that we've wrapped an umbrella around it, the feral domestic, you know, which is an aspiration because we are swept up in the status quo of, you know, putting Survival. kids in public well it's public school and it's dentist appointments and it's cars breaking down and paying taxes and so we can never escape you know and there is something you know when queers are included in marriage say they then we aren't under oppression there's what oppression do you mean? well what do you i mean, mean i'm just saying huh I i'm saying well, what I mean is that, you know, if if Monique, if she's saying, you know, that um, like there's a part of me like, yeah, it's normal. I want to just expand the idea of normal. It is normal to be the way we are. And then there's no need to discriminate. You know, like I feel I feel under the system in our world, you know, if we aren't married, our health insurance is going to be much more expensive. And if I wanted to visit you in the hospital, I might not be allowed. It's the law. I, so I know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm for it. I'm not like some kind of like, I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm just saying that there's like a danger in it of like this kind of like, well, that's our end game. It's like that. We just want to be married and we just want to be like everybody else. You know what I mean? We want to be like the heteronormative. Yeah. So it's impossible. I'm just, We'll I'm just never. saying that I, I know, but I don't, want, I don't <laughs> want that. Like, it's like, I'm not, that's not the universal voice that I think we should, I think we need it like a weirder, um, a stranger, you know, um, options. And, uh, and well, I think it's also ancient options. It's like, you know, there are methods of, of healing you know, that aren't um, tied to the pharmaceutical companies. You know, I mean, we aren't practicing tinctures and, you know, growing herbs to use for, you know, wounds. We're not doing that. But like the aspiration for the feral domestic is is beyond art making. It's like, how can we learn? I mean, to me, to dig into heart space as a way of, managing conflict and to is like that's a lot more interesting than fighting because i'm closed off from the emotional territory of myself so i think it's it's got real like the implication of, you know the idea of honesty what is that mm -hmm. you know that's that's a feral quality the idea of staying present it's not our we didn't make that up. It's knowledge that is handed down if you take the time to pay attention to it. And so it's an aspiration. It's, it's for me, I feel like it's related to something more uh, healthy. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I believe that for you. I believe that for you. Um, I think that the feral domestic, like, is like, a for me is like, just like a way of like constantly imagining, um, you know, different inhabitations, you know, of, of, of our world and like a kind of like a broader embrace of, um, of exactly what the, like the, the mess of it looks like, you know, like, and, and not being afraid to, like bring that forward and that does include conflict and honesty and beauty and all of those things and um and and i so yeah so i i do i i also see it as aspirational um but maybe i see it as like a more like messy kind of um pot or something and and i and i think that I, I don't know, like, I, I kind of like rail against, like, I don't think that we should expand what's 
normal. I mean, maybe we should, I don't really know, but I do feel like I want there to be unknown territory. You know, like mm -hmm. I want there to be things we have not discovered, you know, like, mm -hmm. and I want to not know what feral domestic means. I want to not know because I want to keep figuring it out or like mm -hmm. making proposals for what that could be. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to know everything, you know, like it's like the same way that I wish I could go to a pride parade where I'm just going to like be like, what did I just see? You know what I mean? Like I want to, I want to continue to be surprised by what is possible, you know, and like in that way that Monique Wittig like puts forward like, um, you know, an army of women, you know what I mean? It's like, I want to continue to be surprised by like what I can even imagine into being, you know? Um, so that's, that's my, uh, that's my, that's my wish for feral domestic. Well, thank you so much for this. We are all very, very excited. So I guess maybe just to finish up the conversation, you want to say a couple of words about shameless slide and this iteration you're preparing for you know for the london audiences in terms of shameless light we are so excited too to be able to do this and so thrilled to have the support of um mimosa house it just feels like really um important venue and uh connection to have and i think that that's like one of the reasons that both of us love doing shameless light is as a way to connect with places that we may not live, but um, want to kind of like make a connection with. And in this case, like particularly like the queer community. And um, it's a project that we started in 2016 and um, solicited love letters from um, uh, women um, identified queers or non-binary um, people to read love letters that they had written. And those love letters are read under um, red neon lights that are from a drawing that Danny did of like two funnels kind of like communicating with one another, um, like kind of like, I don't know, not loudspeakers, megaphones, megaphones. And, um, and so the letters are read under this light and um, they've, you know, been letters to, like you were saying earlier, like to historical figures or, you know, our ancestors um, uh, or to community or to lovers, to partners, to those who have passed, to those who don't yet exist. Um, and, and it's like a, I think both of us feel like it's an important way to like let um, queer desire live in um, public space and uh, which doesn't feels like that capacity to live in public spaces being you know diminished or like made sanitized in particular ways like we just talked about and so this just feels like a really important especially as like um, you know women identified like how does that kind of desire get articulated in public space particularly is is a question for us um, so yeah, we're so excited that, um, you know, we're going to have the letters from London queers that are going to be read and we're going to be there to record them and, um, and then have them show for a period of time, I think a month almost at Mimosa House in Camden. Danny, am I forgetting anything? No, I mean, that's, that's, uh, what it is. And, you know, um, because of in 2016, when Trump was elected, it was devastating. And the idea of, of resistance through love, rather than a sort of violent anger, you know, that, you know, shuts people down, shuts everybody down. So that was the impetus to make it. And um, we've seen a lot of uh, sense of freedom by the people that have written the letters. Like they, they, they've articulated something that um, maybe they hadn't before, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, we, when we do the project live, Sheila and I have a love letter to Chantel Ackerman. That's a video that plays nearby, but um, you know, it's always site specific in terms of the, environment. The first time we did it was in a crumbling uh, movie theater that was defunct. 
And so we didn't have to do very much to that space to make it alive. And sometimes we've done it in very sort of uh, simple theaters, you know, cinemas where it's, we've had to um, put down this, we made a rug that we put the microphone on and the people stepped on to just to up the ante of formal engagement. And with this, this iteration, it's going to be recorded uh, on video. And, and so it's a different kind of iteration. And, and someday we hope to publish all the letters that we've gathered over the years. So um, yeah, it doesn't seem like a project that's ending anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, long live love. 